What are the five things you really need for the Christian life? Paul is going to talk about that in his letter to the Ephesians, and we'll look at that today when we come right back. Hi, and welcome to Bible Study with Friends. I'm here with my friend Sherry Mangrum, and Sherry and I are going to continue in our study, finishing up chapter 1 today. We're going to go from verse 15 down to verse 23. And in these pages, we're going to be asking ourselves those interesting questions of what are the essentials in the Christian life? What does Paul consider the absolute needed things for a Christian to understand? Now, remember, the book of Ephesians is written to the church at Ephesus, and he uses the word riches a lot in the first three chapters, teaching us the doctrine of the faith. And he's trying to teach Mm. Christians in Ephesus Mm -hmm. how rich they are in the faith. So let's get into the word together. We're going to start in verse 15. Now, he just got done up to verse 14 talking about the salvation of the believer that, that we were, remember our illustration from last week, that the, we are given the plan of salvation from the Father. We are redeemed in the person of Jesus Christ. And then we're sealed in the Holy Spirit. And he ends in verse 14 about that the Holy Spirit has sealed us and given us that pledge, that promise of our inheritance as Christians. And now he's going to talk a little bit more about what that inheritance is. And he says, for this reason, in verse 15, now when you see something like that, it's like seeing therefore. It's, okay, the reason he is going to write the verses we're about to study is because of what he just talked about in the early part of chapter 1. Because we are given the salvation plan of God, we're redeemed in Christ Jesus, and we're sealed in the Holy Spirit. For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints. So he says, I've heard about you, and I've heard that you are loving Christians. Now from verse 15, I've heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that exists among you and your love for all the saints. And so that's from one aspect of, are people hearing about my faith? The other thing is, he says, having heard of the faith, into verse 16, I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. That's a big question to ask yourself. Yeah. And so if I'm reading an article about a missionary or uh, a, a Christian in Chattanooga or a Christian in Salt Lake or wherever, is my first tendency to praise and say, that's great that they're a believer. Now I want to pray for them. We should have that mindset of hearing about our fellow believers and praying for them and giving thanks to God for them and making mention of them in our prayers. And he says, in fact, I never cease to give thanks for you and and make mention of you in prayer. He says, I'm constantly praying for you. Now, Paul was a busy guy. He had churches all over the known world at the time. And he's got all these churches, and he's writing to many of them. And yet, he says, man, I'm constantly thinking of you guys and praying for you. Now, he does other things. He eats, he sleeps, (laughs) he travels. But this idea of, I move in and out of my prayer mentioning you. I'll be going through the day, and I'll think of you. And this happens with you and me, Sherry. I'll I'll be just going through my day, and all of a sudden, Sherry pops into my mind. And so I pray for Sherry. Thank God for Sherry and our friendship, but also pray for you and your faith. And that's exactly what Paul says in verse 16. Then we go into what he prays. And this is where I really want us to live for this study. He says in verse 16, I don't cease to pray for you, and I mention you in my prayers, that 
the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. So he's he says at verse 17, this is my prayer for you. I've been praying that God would reveal two things, wisdom and knowledge. Okay? Mm -hmm. Wisdom and the revelation of the knowledge of Christ. So we could say that every Christian needs to have wisdom. This is not talking about being worldly wise. Look up 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. Yeah. We do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. Okay, so when Paul is writing here in Ephesus about this wisdom, I pray that God would give you wisdom. He's not talking about human wisdom. He's talking about the wisdom of the mystery of God, which is the gospel, grace mm -hmm. being given. So the first thing we'd say is it's essential for a Christian to understand the wisdom of God in providing that way of salvation. And to yes. apply that wisdom in my life and saying, I need the wisdom of God in my life. Just in order to be saved, I have to understand the wisdom of God in grace. Now, the second thing that goes right with that, he says it in the same sentence, is uh, that the Father would give you a spirit of wisdom. That's wor not worldly wisdom, but wisdom of God. And of revelation in the knowledge of him. So the second thing that every Christian needs is they need to be able to go to the revelation, which is not the book of Revelation, but the entire revelation of God, the scriptures, and get a knowledge of Jesus. I'm praying that you get the revelation of the fact that you can know Jesus Christ personally. So the wisdom of God's plan of salvation, remember that little box last week we talked about the plan of salvation comes from the Father. It's available to everybody. Yes. So uh, understand the wisdom of God that he has provided us in understanding the gospel. That this, there is a way of salvation available. And then the revelation of knowing Jesus Christ, our Savior. Those are two essentials. If somebody says, I'm a Christian, but I really don't know Jesus. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. The whole thing about being saved in the plan of salvation, the wisdom of God is that we who are not real smart, he says, the, uh, I have put the wisdom of God in the foolishness of man's heart. So I don't have to be smart to understand God's wisdom. And God's wisdom is I can't earn salvation. I just have to receive it. Yes. Amen. And once I receive it, I get to have a relationship. Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship with Jesus. And that's essential. So then we go on. And he continues in his prayer. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be in, enlightened. Now, I really like that term. In fact, I underlined it there. The eyes of your heart. Does it remind you of words in the song? Yeah. Open, Open the, the eyes, eyes of, of my, my heart, heart, Lord. That's right. That's right. It's a great song and terrific words. But this idea of open the eyes of my heart, this is an internal thing. This is my prayer for you, that the Lord would open the eyes of your heart, that you might be enlightened so that you will know. So God has the eternal plan. You accept Christ and you get to know him. And then he gives you a hope. Now, you and I have talked about a hope. He says, I want you to be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. So what's the biblical definition of hope? 
if I get up in the morning and say, uh, I hope the weather's nice today, that's a kind of a wish, isn't it? So this idea of hope in modern vernacular, hope has become a wish. I hope so. But biblical hope is a confidence where it says, my hope is in the Lord. That's saying my confidence is in him. All of my confidence, that is my hope. And so we have to put aside the modern vernacular. And when we see this word hope, we need to read it as confidence. Okay. So he says, I pray that you might be enlightened so that you will know what is the confidence of his calling. I just got done talking in chapter one about you were called before the foundation of the earth. You've been marked chosen and you've been given a destination. So this idea that you have a confidence in his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? That's God's inheritance. God mm. gives us the riches. There's that word riches in verse mm. 8. And that's mm -hmm. understanding the riches of the glory is understanding the confidence we have in all those riches that God gives the riches. I don't earn them. Mm -hmm. We learned that the Holy Spirit was his down payment of those riches. That's exactly right. They're a down payment. If you look up in verse 14 about he is the pledge of our inheritance. Then down here, he's talking about the riches of the glory of our inheritance. And once we understand what the riches and glory of our inheritance are, we become confident in our faith. So that's yes. the third of the five is okay. to have this confidence in verse 18. So we saw understanding the wisdom of God, understanding the knowledge of Jesus Christ, the relationship, the knowing Jesus, then understanding our confidence. You see where if any of these three you don't have, you need to really stop and go back and say, boy, I need to confirm that I understand the plan of salvation. I need to understand that I know Jesus. And I need to know that I have a confidence in my faith. Not a Without... confidence that I can keep it, but a confidence in what Jesus and God give me. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think without those basic principles, when times start getting hard, that's when people give up. Yeah. Instead of enduring. And because, a lot of times God can put us through trials to strengthen yes, those very things. Absolutely. Uh, yes. And we it's not a sin to question your salvation as long as you go to the word and get what that salvation plan is about and yeah. get who Jesus is. Yeah. And get what our confidence can be. Go to the book of Hebrews. Look up the word confidence in a concordance. The word is used like six or eight times in the book of Hebrews. This idea of we can have a confidence in God, a confidence in Christ, and a confidence in our salvation. Yeah. Okay? So this idea of that third thing is that we would know the hope, the confidence we have. And then that moves us into that we would know the riches, because he says in verse 18, you will know what is the hope of his calling, mm -hmm. that's salvation, the confidence of his calling, and what the riches and glory of his inheritance. So the fourth thing is that you understand how rich you are in Christ. And we talked about this last week that in, in Second Peter, it talks about we have been given everything we need in the heavenly places. And even in the first part of this, God has given us everything we need as far as our inheritance. He doesn't hold back. He gives us all of the glory of our inheritance is he's the glory. He has given it to us. If we back up to 17, the very end phrase of verse 17 is that we would have wisdom, and a revelation of the knowledge of him. Now, that word knowledge in the Greek means a personal, intimate knowing. Uh -huh. okay? Okay. Not abstract knowledge, but an intimate knowing. And he says, so this knowledge of Jesus 
is an intimate knowing. Now, when he talks about verse 18, and he says, you will know what is the hope of his calling, the confidence. That word know means to, to have factual knowledge. Okay? So yeah. he says, I want you to understand it's a fact that you can have a confidence in your salvation and have that yeah. actual knowledge. And then he talks about these graces. That's the fourth prayer request. He says, so that you would know the riches of your inheritance. And this is the last one of the four that you would know what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. This is in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. Now, two things. Whose power is given to us? Whose? His power. God's she, power. Yeah. Now, that word power is, is dynamis. It's where we get the word mm. dynamite from. Mm. It's This is powerful. And in fact, he says, it's a surpassing greatness. This is amazing, surpassing greatness. And it surpasses everything else. The surpassing greatness of his power towards us. Now, it's his power. It's not our power. It's God's power directed towards us. Let me ask a question. How much power does God have? Now, Absolute think, power. Think about that. That God has given us his power. So how much yeah, no, I, I can't even understand that sentence right. you're saying. But if we begin to understand the power of God and that God has given us that power, why? Because we have a relationship with him, because we're saved, we have riches of inheritance. You see how the other four go. Now, this is yeah. verse, verse five is that you would understand that you're not some weak Christian that just has to be meek and it's like you have the power of God behind you because you know him and you're saved by him and you have a confidence in him and you're sealed in only remember that from last week yes so he says that his power towards us who believe these what the surpassing greatness right these are yes. in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. Now, this is huge, and I think it's something we can pray for each other. I need to pray for you, and you need to pray for me, that we do not depend upon our own might. Yeah. It's the working of the strength of God in us, not our own strength. That's the same thing. It's his power. It's not our power. And it's his strength. It's not our strength. And the older we get, the more I understand this. And the more we need, it's an essential in the Christian life to understand his power is given to us. And we are strong in him, not mm. because of our own strength. So true. if somebody says, I'm a Christian, I've accepted Christ, I know Jesus, and I'm really working hard at being strong so that I can get stuff done. Wait a minute. Whose strength are you working on? <laughs> if you're working on your strength, you're going to have a real problem, right? Yes. So let's continue on. He says, the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ. So how do we get that strength? How do we get that power? Christ. There's that little term in again that he uses over and over again. He brought about this strength and this power in Christ. When he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly places. So this is the idea of, I'm demonstrating how powerful I am. I'm raising Jesus, mm. who is dead. And that's a demonstration of how much power does God have? He can raise people from the dead. That's how much power he's got. And, he says, and, and Jesus is still alive. He didn't die again. That's right. And he set him at the right hand in the heavenly places. And then this little caveat. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. So Jesus has been placed 
on God's right hand far above anything or anyone. Now, this is interesting because Jesus is above all rule and authority. Now, he's been, he, he said in the book of Romans to pray for the governing authorities. So he says, pray for your government. That's great. But Jesus is not under your government. Jesus is above your government. Mm. And when I think of this, I think of the Jesus is far above all authority and rule and power and dominion and every name that is named, including your name. Jesus is above your rule. He's above your authority. He's above your power. And he's above your name. Without Jesus, our name is nothing. Think, Without yes. Jesus, we have no rule. We have no authority. I was talking with a young man this morning about the fact that I'm just a slave. It's all about Jesus. It's not about me. And before and, Jesus, I felt like all of those things. I felt like I wasn't worth anything. And what did I matter in this world? And what was I doing? We go from that feeling, Sherry, of I'm nothing to the feeling of I'm large and in charge. A lot of Christians say, I, I am the rule of my life. Invictus is, I am the captain of my faith. I am the ruler. That's not true. And it's not biblical. There is one ruler, one authority, one dominion, and it's Jesus Christ. And he is far above anything else, including ourselves. And verse 22 and 23, he put all things in subjection under his feet. Now, the first he is God. He's Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God, and God has placed him above everything. And then it says, and he, God, put all things in subjection under his, Jesus, feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church. He gave him to the church, to us believers. Now, a question I have in verse 22 is, he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. What are the all things? Over all things to the church. That would be... Everything. All means all. If we know those five essentials, the plan, know Jesus, have a confidence in his hope, have the understanding of what our riches are, and the power of God that's available to us, if those five essential things, then we are going to understand we need to put everything in subjection under Jesus and not say, that's under my control. If God puts all things in subjection to Jesus, I should take all things in my life and put them in subjection to Jesus. There's this comment, he gave it to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And I, whenever I read that, he'll, he fills all in all. I think of Romans eleven thirty five 35, that says, all things are from him. All things are through him. Mm. All things are to him, to the glory of God. Now, and basically he says, Jesus is the fullness of God in everything. He fills everything. He is everything. So I can ask myself the ending question. Are those five things that Paul is saying, these are essential things that I pray for every Christian. Are they part of your life? The plan of salvation, understanding and knowing Jesus Christ personally, the confidence we have in hope, the riches of our inheritance as Christians and understanding all the things we have as Christians, and then the power of God in us. Are those five things in your life in the context of Jesus is my all in all? Have I surrendered to that? Yes. And asking ourselves some really good questions. We've been talking about these things that are absolutely required, absolutely necessary for a successful Christian life. And I want to recommend to you another video. It's called Having Confidence 
in a saving grace. I hope you enjoy it. And listen, we're going to continue next week in chapter two of the book of Ephesians. And until then, God bless you.